Well, I love being here. I think this is the third or fourth time that I've been able to, to jump up here. Uh, once again, my name is Chad Lunsford and uh, live down in Indianapolis, a part of a church called Traders Point Christian Church. Uh, my wife, Katie, and our kids are here with us today. And uh, again, I, I absolutely love this place. Every time I'm here, you guys fill me up with faith. I love Pastor Greg and Jamie and the whole team and all that God is doing in and through Suncrest. I know you've already made a little bit of noise, but come on, can we celebrate what God's doing in and around here? Come on. Absolutely. Well, I, uh, I'm going to begin opening up the scriptures today. I hope you like the Bible because we're going to look at it a lot today. Hopefully it doesn't feel that way, but I'm really excited about where we're going to, uh, what we're going to be walking through. And as we're opening up the scriptures, even here at the beginning, I, wanna, I want you to do two things as we're looking at the scriptures. Uh, number one, I want you to, to look for the heart of God. As we're reading the scriptures, I want you to, to ask yourself, like, where do I see the heart of God coming through? And when you do, that's really important because when you look and see the heart of God back in the scriptures thousands of years ago, you need to recognize that the heart of God persists. That who God was then is who God is now. What he wanted for Israel, we're going to be looking at the Old Testament, is what he wants for you. The second thing I want us to do today is when we're looking at Israel is to ask ourselves the question, in what ways am I like them? If I'm not mindful, in what ways am I prone to do some of the things they did, to make the decisions that they made, to be afraid like them? All right, I want us to do those two things as we are hopping in. Uh, we're going to start with Exodus chapter 3, and then we're going to kind of fast forward along through uh, several different scriptures. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, it says this, Then the Lord told him, he's talking about uh, Moses, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt. I want you to see this into their own fertile and spacious land. God doesn't just want to set them free. God wants to give them a land that is their own. And it's going to be an incredibly special and overflowing kind of space. It goes on to say, it is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where, now I could have skipped this part, uh, but I, I want to come back to it here in just a second. So I wanted to highlight it. The Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. It sounded like I was just sneezing up on stage. I recognize that. Uh, look, verse 9, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. Verse 10, now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Now he's talking to Moses. I'm going to skip over a lot so we can fast forward in the story. Uh, but you need to recognize that Moses does go. He does what God tells him to. Uh, Pharaoh won't let the people leave. Uh, he wants to keep them in slavery. Eventually, he relents because God causes 12 plagues uh, to happen on, uh, to come upon the land. And eventually, he lets them go. Uh, when they do, uh, God parts the Red Sea. The waters stand up wall to wall, and Israel walks across the, the, the sea on dry land. God performs an incredible miracle. God delivers them. Now, we're going to fast forward. He's leading them into the promise. Now, I want you to see that's the, the heart of God. He wants to deliver them out of where they are and lead them into the more that he created them for. Now, let's look at the people. Numbers chapter 13, starting with verse 17. Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like. Verse 27. This was their report back to Moses when they come back. We enter the land you sent us to explore. It is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you see? It's the exact same words that God used to say, this is where I'm taking you. They go, they spy it out, and they're like, it's exactly as God said. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. They brought back some of the spoils. Verse 28, there's a really big but here in the story. But the people living there are powerful. And their towns are large and fortified. We saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Now Moses might be thinking, well, are there people there that are different than what God said would be there? And they report, no, it's the exact same 
people. The Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. They're coming back afraid. Moses must be like, well, what's going on? It must be a different enemy. No, no, it's the exact same people that God said. It's exactly as God said it would be, but they're afraid. Uh, Verse 30, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. Another big but. Verse 31, but the other men who explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. Now, it's possible that the people who are giving the bad report were correct, that they were stronger, that they did look like giants, that they did feel like grasshoppers next to them, but that wasn't the point. The point was that God said that they could win, that God said, this is my promise. I'm going to take you in. I don't know about you. Have you ever felt like a grasshopper standing next to a challenge in your life? A medical report, a a dream that you have had, a a situation in a relationship. It it feels so big next to you. Verse 14, chapter 1. Then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Now I've got to point out These are the exact same people that stood on the shores of the Red Sea, watched the waters part, walked across it on dry land. They saw God perform miracles. They followed after Moses. And it says they began weeping aloud. They cried all night. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? That's not what God said. What happened, God said he would take them in, but they are afraid they're going to die. Verse four, then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm reading the scriptures, it's kind of funny. It sort of feels like probably leading Israel is a lot like being a college football coach today. Like, I know you won last week, but this week you're a bum because we lost. We want you out, right? Like, Moses is the guy who rose his staff and the waters parted, and they're like, we want a new guy. And we want to go back to the place that we were in slavery. Why? Because we're afraid of the challenge that is ahead. We can see God's heart. We can see the people's inclinations. And God's heart remains today, not only to them, but to you. I want more for you. The people's heart is, this is too hard. Let's go back to where we were. If I was to give today's message a title, I'd call it just three simple words, made for more. You are made for more. If I could have a subtitle, it would be three more words. Don't stop short. Don't, don't stop short. God had more for them, but most of them never get to experience the more because of fear they end up stopping short of what God had for them. What about you? Have you ever found yourself stopping short of the more that God has for you? So often we want the more that God has for us, but The obstacles we face along the journey causes us to stop short. This was illustrated for me powerfully uh, years ago. Uh, My wife, Katie, and I, uh, we lived in West Central Indiana along with our 18-month-old Ava, who is now 18 years old. Somebody pray for me, all right? And we felt called to go be a part of a church out in Los Angeles. I was going to be a ministry resident. I was accepted into a graduate program. Uh, to make this trek, it required we uh, sell our house. We sold most of our belongings. What was left, we were going to pile into a 14-foot trailer and drive it across the country out to Los Angeles. Um, I, I should point out that I have, um, to that point, I had never uh, driven a trailer across town, let alone across the country, all right? I thought, what's the the worst, what's the worst that could, that could happen? Uh, and oh, by the way, I was going to pull it across the, the country in a Nissan Xterra. Come on, somebody who remembers the, <laughs> the Xterra. So moving day came and uh, I, again, I didn't know what I was doing. I got all the furniture, the heavy stuff, and I put it in the front of the trailer and then I loaded up everything in there after. And then eventually I decided it was time to back up the Nissan X-Terror to, to the trailer. And I had some blocks sitting up underneath the, the front of the trailer and I, I 
connected the trailer to the Nissan Xterra's hitch, and then I uh, went to move the blocks, and the blocks wouldn't budge. There was too much weight from the trailer that was sitting on the blocks, and I didn't know what to do, so I went to one of my neighbors, and I asked for a sledgehammer. I, I come back, and I swing as hard as I can at the blocks. The block goes flying. The problem was the trailer went to the ground, so the back of the trailer was going like this, and the front of my Nissan Terra was going like this. My car and the trailer were hitting the ground in a V. I was in trouble, you know what I mean? I didn't know what to do, uh, so I called uh, family, and I was like, hey, I've been loading all day, not really sure what I did wrong. Evidently, I did something wrong. I don't think we can get to LA uh, like this. They came to help me unload everything uh, and load it back correctly. If you're ever in the same position, you put the weight over the axle, so you, you now are, are smarter, smarter than me. Uh, we were late getting out, so we finally were able to get out the, the next day, but I was thinking as we were trying to make this trek how many times in our lives do we want to do great things for God? We want to do great things in our lives, and we never make it out of the parking lot, right? We hit obstacles, we hit fears, we, we talk ourselves out of it, and we never even get there. I'm also reminded that whatever journey God has us on, we're never going to make it there alone. We, we, we need, we must have the right people around us. Well, the next morning we uh, headed out on uh, the adventure, and uh, I wish the problems were behind us. Most of them were uh, ahead of us. Uh, quickly, we recognize that when you pour a, pull a 14-foot trailer with a Nissan Xterra, you must stop for gas every hour on the hour. Like that's from there to LA, pretty much every hour you're stopping for gas. If you can travel by map with me, uh, we went to St. Louis and spent the night in Oklahoma City. Uh, the next day, Oklahoma City through North Texas, we landed in uh, Am or not, not Amarillo, but um, Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. Uh, so on morning three, Albuquerque sits down in a valley. So to get out, you have to drive up the mountain to get out. Uh, we were having so much trouble with the Nissan Xterra. We were going so slow going up the mountain, semis were passing us. <laughs> they were like, get out of our way. And I don't know, we were going maybe 20 miles an hour going up. And eventually, somewhere in that process, the air conditioner stops working about the time we reached the Mojave Desert. I forgot to mention it's July. So it's a lovely time to, to be there. Easily 120 degrees as we're driving through the Mojave Desert, windows down, toddler in the backseat, dad of the year driving, right? Like this is not going well. Do you ever have those moments where you're like, what have I done? <laughs> like this is this is not going well. God, what have I gotten myself into? Somehow, please get me out of it. I don't know if you've ever had those moments when like you're, you're trying to go after a dream, after a destiny, after what God has for you. You hit challenge after challenge. You begin thinking to yourself, enough is enough. And if you are in that space today, can I just encourage you, don't, and don't stop short. I know for us, as we were finally making our way into California towards the end of day three, we had to stop because the car was overheating. We crossed the border into the lovely little town of Needles, California. If you've never been to Needles, it sounds exactly like the name, or it is exactly like the name. If you've never been there, don't go, okay? I just, I've been there for you. You don't need to go. We found what we thought was the best hotel in town. We stopped. I said hotel, I should correct myself, it was a motel. Uh, so we had to walk up the, you know, the stairs on the outside and we're going to the motel. Room number one, air conditioner doesn't work. Room number two, kind of worked. Air conditioner kind of worked. Uh, so we thought, let's go down, we'll jump in the pool. There was like an indoor pool. We'll jump in the pool, that'll cool us off. Uh, we jumped in the pool, the pool was easily 100 degrees and we recognized as we're getting in, uh, it both smelled funny and was green. So it was probably not where we wanted to spend too much time. So we decided, let's go get showers and we're just gonna like, we're gonna go to bed. We'll get up at 3 a.m. when like it cools off and it's like, I don't know, 110 degrees. Um, before I'm about to turn the light off, I wish I was making this up. Before I'm about to turn the light off, I see something moving on the wall. I walk up, look closely, and there are these little tiny green worms crawling out of the wall. I don't think anybody slept that night. Right? It was like, we, it was, you know, we turn the lights off. We're like, let's just, like, we got to make it through the night. We, we got up at 3 a.m. We, we rolled out of lovely Needles, California, because, because Needles wasn't our destination. Are you with me? What, what if, what if, Somewhere in the midst of all that, maybe the green worms was the, like the last straw. If my 18-month-old could communicate well with us, what if she pulled, pulled us aside? Mom and dad, we're going to have a family meeting. Um, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this isn't working. Every inch forward, it gets worse. Instead of going forward, let's either stay or let's go back. Now, 
we would think, well, that's ridiculous because we have a destination of mind. And yet, how often in our lives do we stop short? We hit obstacle after obstacle. It just gets harder and harder. And sometimes we just think it's not worth it. I'm not going to keep moving forward for that thing that God has called me to do, for to stick it out in that relationship, to stick it out in that p- position. Whatever it might be, we stop short or we want to go back to the way things were, and yet God is calling us forward. Day four, we hopped in the car. We rolled into Los Angeles, Pasadena specifically. Um, it's kind of mid-morning, but I'm pretty sure we looked a lot more like the Beverly Hillbillies than we did look like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Are you with me? Like we were, we were in, we were sorry, sorry shape driving through the desert with no, no air conditioning. We, 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 we couldn't stop short. Are you with me? How many times in our lives do we stop, stop short? Needles was not the destination Pasadena was. And though they're in the same state, needles is to Pasadena as roadkill is to flame and yawn. Come on, somebody. Like it was not, they were not the same place. And so often in our lives, we stop in needles because we're afraid of moving forward to the place that God actually wants to take us. Can I ask you today, have you stopped short? Israel lost sight of where God wanted to take them. Have, have you lost sight of where God wants to take you? You. Have, you, have you begun to believe some lies that you aren't enough or that thing that you're pushing for, just it can't happen? Maybe you're afraid of what it'll cost or you're unsure of where God wants to take you or the path that he wants to, to take you to get there. Maybe you're settling for less in your life right now. Perhaps you've lost your vision. You've lost that fire. Uh, maybe there's something that's sort of like numbing you out from living fully. Most of us want the more that God has for us, but we end up stopping short because of the obstacles we encounter along the way. So the question I have for us today is, how do you run after God's best for your life? What does it look like to keep moving forward when so, when so often it feels like it's easier to just stop short? While most of Israel ends up passing away, the entire generation never gets to see the promise The good news is two of them do. Joshua and Caleb are faithful. They come back with a good report. They get to enter into the promised land. That's great news because we get to look at their example. We get to see what they did and do exactly as they did. So here's what I want to do with the rest of our time. I want to give us three ways that you and I can go after the more that God has for us so that we don't stop short in our own lives. Here they are, three things. Number one, experiencing God's best requires faith-filled action. Experiencing God's best requires faith-filled action. We aren't made to shrink back. We're made to move forward, and it always requires fresh faith. We can't rely on our faith from the past. We got to step into what God has for us today. Joshua uh, chapter 1, starting with verse 1, it says this, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, I know that seems like a funny place to stop, right? Why are we highlighting the fact that Moses, my servant, is dead? I do that because there could be somebody here today, and you could put yourself in Joshua's shoes. For years, he was Moses' assistant. So he was in the number two chair whenever Moses was leading. So he didn't have to have faith of his own. He just had to follow Moses. Are you with me? And whatever Moses said, we did. And as Moses followed God, we followed him. But God wants to point out, Moses isn't here anymore. I'm looking at you, Joshua. And maybe some of us in the room today have been looking at somebody else's faith. And God says, enough is enough. I'm looking at you. It's time for you to step out in faith. You can't rely on them anymore. I need you to step out in faith. I need you to have faith-filled action. Going on in verse two. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you. The promise stood for Joshua and the people. He's saying, you may have turned your back on me, but I haven't forgotten my promise that I've made to you. And God says to us, I want to take you into a promise. I want to do great things in and through your life, but you've got to have faith-filled action. Verse 5, 
No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. He's just not talking to Joshua. He's talking to us. I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land that I swore to their ancestors I would give them. It's an incredible passage where God's making promises. He's extending the promise to Moses to Joshua. And he's saying, I will be with you. All you have to do is show up for the battle, but I will be the one fighting the battle. No one will be able to stand against you. I won't fail you. I won't abandon you. I will be with you. And the promise is true even for us today. And so God says to him and he says to us, be strong and courageous And as you do, you'll help others inherit the goodness of God. God reminded me of this just a handful of months ago. For the better part of the last year, about maybe 14 months, uh, I've been undergoing some treatments for uh, chronic back and neck pain. I won't bore you with the details of it, but to kind of set the scene a little bit, when I go in, I I get hooked up to to a machine uh, through an IV and Uh, When I do this, I have to sit with a nurse the whole time. It can take anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes, uh, sometimes, you know, closer to the 90 minute mark. And I'm always with the same nurse. So she can't leave the room and it's always the same person. My point is, I go in about every four to six months. We've gotten to know each other fairly well as I'm sitting there hooked up to to this machine. And uh, a few months in, uh, I could tell just based on our conversations that she was spiritual, but she was not a follower of Jesus. And I felt just a nudge from the Holy Spirit one day say, hey, it's time to share with her about Jesus. And like any of you, I kind of got afraid. I mean, part of me, if I'm being honest, was like, Lord, she could hurt me. I'm hooked up to an IV. Like this could go, this could go bad, bad for me if she doesn't like what I have to say. But I just, I, I felt nudged by the Holy Spirit. So I'm thinking to myself like, well, what, what am I going to say? How, like, how can I work it into the conversation? And so as we're catching up, uh, she says, what's new with you? Well, I had just back in the spring published my uh, book. And so I just shared, well, I, I just published a book. It's called uh, Made for More. And God's really been blessing. And at the time it was like number one on Amazon. And she was like, well, tell me about the book. And so I was like, here's my, here's my opportunity, right? Well, I started sharing, well, God made you to do more. God wants to bring out more in your life. The problem is we often face obstacles and we shrink back, but Jesus died so that you could live into him. So that you, he, he died so that you could live into the fullness that God designed you and created you for. And so I asked her this question. I said, do you ever feel like you were made for more? More than just getting by, more than just sort of going through the rhythm of life, that God wants to do something in your life? And she said, yes, but I'm not entirely sure how to go after it. And so for the better part of the next hour, we just talked together. And I just shared my story and some of the miracles God's done in my life. And if I'm being 100% honest, I wasn't sure how she was responding to the conversation. She was being polite but I couldn't tell if I was impacting her or offending her. I really, I really wasn't sure. And when I came back in the, the, the next time, as she got me hooked up to the machine, she looked at me. She said, I need to share something with you. In fact, I think the word she used was, I feel called to, to say something to you. <laughs> I was like, well, I, those words sound familiar. Go ahead. Like, what do, you, what do you mean? She said, after we talked at your last appointment, I was driving home and she said, you inspired me. She said, for at least the last decade plus, I've been running from God as far as I could. But she said, uh, after after your appointment with what you were sharing, I felt led to give God another chance. And she said, when I got home, I was sharing the the story with my husband and I was talking about the conversations we had. And she said, I I think we're supposed to give God another shot. And she's like, I I almost fell out of my seat. My husband said, you're not going to believe this. But as I was driving around today, I had the exact same idea that we need to give God another shot. She said that week, one of our friends reached out to us, invited us to church. We thought we have to go. They went to church. And then when I came back in the next time, she's like, we haven't stopped going ever since. <laughs> like we're, we're locked in. We're following after Jesus. We're, we're actually serving in the church. Like we're, we're going after this man named Jesus. And she said, I want you to know it was because of that conversation. I mean, it is incredible what God can do with our faith. And can I just be honest? Like, like any of you, like I was scared 
I was scared to have faith. I, I, was, I was scared to step into that moment. I don't have time to talk about all the times when I've shrunk back. Are you with me? <laughs> From those moments where I was like, I should say something, but I didn't. But isn't it incredible when we step forward in kindness and yet boldness with what God is calling us to do, how God moves through our faith-filled action? Maybe while I'm speaking, you are feeling stirred in your own heart. Maybe it's to share the goodness that God has in you with somebody. But maybe it's to forgive someone. Maybe it's to try something new. Maybe it's trusting God in an area where you've had a hard time doing it. Maybe it's repenting of something that you've been walking in. But whatever it is, it will require faith-filled action on your part. That's number one. Here's number two. Experiencing God's best requires divine confidence. It requires divine confidence. In other words, walking in God's best will require you to boldly walk in God's ways. Boldly walking in the way that God tells you to do. If we back up again to Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, what did God say to Joshua? Be strong and very courageous. Look at these next words. Be careful to obey all the instructions that Moses gave you. Come on, can we be honest? Sometimes walking with God doesn't make sense. Are you with me? <laughs> Sometimes walking with God, it doesn't make sense to us, and it certainly doesn't make sense to people who aren't following after Jesus. But even when it doesn't make sense, we can have divine confidence because God said it. Let me give you an example. These are the instructions that God is going to give to Joshua and to Israel to obey as they're entering into the promised land. Joshua chapter 6 Verse one, now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. Can I just point that out for a second? The prior generation never went into the promised land because they were afraid of the people. They were too big. When this generation finally obeys and moves in, what happens? <laughs> the people are afraid of them. They wandered for 40 years and never got to see it. And all they had to do was trust God. No one was allowed to go out or in, but the Lord said to Joshua, I've given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. Let's keep going. You and your fighting men, here's the strategy God's gonna give them, should march around the town once a day for six days. Anybody else think this sounds like a horrible strategy when you're about to go into battle? <laughs> I mean, if I'm, if I'm Joshua, I'm like, God, I heard you wrong. You want us to march around the city? that we're about to invade for six days. They're going to see all the fighting men. They're going to see all of our weapons. And God's like, yes, that's exactly what I want you to do. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. Now, I think this is kind of interesting. Again, sometimes when I read the scriptures, it's funny. I know back when I played football and we would show up at the uh, opposing team's field. Anybody else know what you do first? You send off the big guys first to intimidate the, the home team. Are you with me? That's not what they do. They send out the musicians. Now, I love musicians. They're, they're fantastic. But I'm just saying, I would send out the big guys first. But that's not, that's not what God does. No, no, no. We're going to send out the priests that are carrying the ram's horns, the musicians. Here we go. On the seventh day, it just goes from bad to worse. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. So the musicians are making a lot of noise. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. So when we're about to attack the people, we want to notify them when we're going to do it. God's like, yes, <laughs> it's awful. It's a terrible strategy. Then the walls of the town, do you see this? The walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. If we're being honest, I know some of you have read this story before, so you know it. But if we're being honest, it's a terrible strategy. It sounds like a five-year-old came up with it. Come on. We're going to scream, and then the walls are going to fall down, and then we're going to go take it. In. That's not how it works, right? But the point isn't that they had a great strategy. The point isn't that they were great at their military. The point isn't that they were stronger than them. The point was, will you obey me? Will you trust me? Will you walk confidently in my ways even when it doesn't make sense? <laughs> they have to do exactly as God said or it doesn't work. Come on, six days, we're gonna march around. If they get to day four and they're like, God, some of the warriors are starting to get blisters on their feet. Can we call it? Like, this, like we did it for four days. It was close enough, right? I had to do it six. On the seventh day, what if they get to marching around five and it's like, God, it looks like the... 
the enemy, like they're starting to get their walls ready. They, they sense something's coming. We're going to go ahead and attack now. It doesn't work. They have to do exactly as God said. And so often in our lives, we want to what? We want to stop short. God, it doesn't make sense. You, you want me to get dunked underwater? <laughs> Why would I do that? You want me to give back the first 10% of my income? That doesn't make sense. That's not what the world does. You want me to honor God with my sexuality? But that's not how the world values sexuality. You want me to go and serve other people regularly? Why? You want me to give up a day of my week every week for the rest of my life and go and be with God's people and to worship you? Yeah, but it doesn't make sense. But God said it. And when we're walking boldly in God's ways, when we have divine confidence that it's what God has spoken, we can have confidence that that's what's going to lead us to walking fully into the more that God has for every single one of us. Things don't always make sense, <laughs> but we can look back and say, yeah, but I obeyed God and look at what he has done. When I felt the nudging of the Holy Spirit to share my faith and to kind of share my story with that nurse, I didn't know how it was going to come out, but I knew that God has called all of us as followers of Jesus to kindly but confidently share what God has done in us. And as I did, God did incredible things in her and her family and is continuing to write that story. Uh, obedience is our part. What God does with the obedience is his part. That, that's, that, that's, that's the second thing. The three requirements to run after God's best so we don't stop short. Number one, faith-filled action. Number two, divine confidence. Here's the third and final thing. Experiencing God's best requires a vision-centered perseverance. Vision-centered perseverance. Just like our wild journey heading out to Los Angeles, our lives will be filled with obstacles. We have to recognize when we hit obstacles, they aren't the enemy. Quite often, obstacles are the way. Obstacles are how God grow, grows us up. It's how he fortifies us. It's how he builds character in us. As he does things in us, then he does things through us. But God's work always begins in us. We hit the obstacles and we don't turn around. We don't stop short. We lean into them with God's help. Let's go back to Joshua chapter one, verse seven, the whole verse this time. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Then he says this, do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. He's saying you got to persevere. You got to keep doing it. Keep, keep showing up. Keep doing what God said. Keep going when it's hard. Keep going when you want to quit. When you aren't seeing the results, keep trusting. As Israel is moving into the promised land, they, they hit obstacle after obstacle. But I want you to look at Caleb's response. Caleb has such perseverance. In fact, it's one of my favorite verses in all scripture. Joshua chapter 14, verse six. Caleb said to Joshua, I was 40 years old when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. He was one of the spies. I returned and gave an honest report, but my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. So that day, Moses solemnly promised me the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your grant of land and that of your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God because you had vision-centered perseverance. Now watch this. Verse 10. Now as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made the promise. Even while Israel wandered in the wilderness, today I'm 85 years old. I love this. I'm as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey. I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So give me the hill country the Lord promised me. If the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land just as the Lord said. Come on, who's a fan of Caleb, right? 85 years old. I'm as strong now as I was then. Caleb recognizes that it's actually not even about his strength. It's about God showing up. If the Lord is with me. I love how Caleb was confident for 45 years. God made me a promise then. I'm going to stay alive and I'm going to see it. I'm going to walk it out. Come on. Some of us have a hard time being faithful for 45 minutes. Come on, let's be honest. 45 days, maybe. 45 years. That's vision-centered perseverance. God said it. 
I'm going to believe it. Even when what I see doesn't match what God said, I'm going to keep persevering, doing the right things. Caleb knew it wasn't about his strength. It was about God's faithfulness. And when God begins to unveil a vision for what he can do in your life, it's going to require perseverance on your part. It's going to require perseverance as God continues to do his work in you and in time brings it out of you. Come on. Is there an area of your life where you've lost heart? Is there an area of your life where you've stopped short? There's a relationship that's been tough. There's a calling. You're not seeing the fruitfulness. Uh, You're having troubles continuing to be obedient, so you've settled for less. How was Caleb able to say, I'm as strong today as I was back then? I want to show you a secret. It's actually back at the beginning of the book. Joshua chapter 3. These are our final verses. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and he set out from, I'm not going to say that word. I'm going to let you guys say it. We'll let Pastor, ask Pastor Greg how to say that whenever he's back next week, okay? And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the ark represents the presence of God. You got to recognize that. As soon as you see the ark representing the presence of God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. As the presence of God moves, you move. As God moves ahead of you, you move after it. Verse four, yet there should be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. It's about a half mile. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way that you shall go, for you've not passed this way before. It's about a half mile. Why? They haven't gone this way before. And the instructions are, you follow the presence of God. Don't get ahead of him and pick out your own way. Don't get so far back that you can't see it. Stay close enough so you can follow the presence of God. How are you going to go after the more God has for you? You're going to follow the presence of God. He continues on, verse 5. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Church, the Lord wants to do wonders among you. As a church, as individuals, as households, God wants to do wonders among you. How do you go after the more? You follow the presence of God. How do you follow after the presence of God? You consecrate yourself. It's a fancy way of saying set yourself apart to God. How was Caleb as strong 45 years later? How was was he able to stay faithful to God? He consecrated himself. It was a pre-decision. I'm going to follow after God no matter what. Can I just encourage you today, if you've been ready to throw in the towel on something, if you've ready, been ready to stop short, would today be a marker where you just say, no, 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 I'm going to consecrate myself to God. I'm going to follow after the presence of the Lord. I believe he has more for me. Well, I really hope that was helpful for integrating faith with life. Listen, if you're in Northwest Indiana, I'd love to have you join us in person. Head over to suncrest.org and plan your visit.